Good evening, colleagues, and welcome to another webinar proudly hosted by the South African Dental Association, KZN Broad. Before I introduce you to our speaker for tonight, there are just a few house rules to go through. Kindly refrain from using the raised hand feature. You may type your comments and questions in the Q&A tab. CPD certificates will be loaded to the SADA platform and you'll be able to access all your certificates under your member profile. If you are not a SADA member, you'll be able to create a profile for yourself and access your CPD certificates. The event for tonight qualifies for one clinical CEU. If you're experiencing difficulty accessing the Zoom platform, we are also streaming live on YouTube. Before I introduce our speaker for tonight, I want to thank all delegates for making themselves available for our webinar tonight. There are a few um, YouTube links that will be shared in the, in the discussion panel, which are part of the um, presentation. The gift to heal is perhaps one of the greatest blessings bestowed to us. Our speaker for tonight, Dr. Abraham Patel, better known as Eb, has a deep rooted passion for endodontic therapy and has dedicated himself fully to the science of endodontics. E.B. obtained his Bachelor of Dental Surgery degree at Wits University in 2008, and then completed his Master's in Endodontics, also from Wits in 2014. He has received numerous awards, including the Hugo Retief Award from the International Association of Dental Research, South Africa, the South African Dental Association Leadership Medal, the African Oxygen Bronze Medal, the Sid Setsa Milner Pedodontic Prize, the Public Oral Health Prize and the Golden Key Award for Academic Excellence at WITS. He is currently the head of preclinical teaching in operative dentistry and endodontics at WITS University and actively teaches and supervises undergraduate and postgraduate students. EB's expertise is constantly sought after to train private dentists at events, workshops, and conferences around the country. Thank you for being part of this event and good luck with your EB. I now hand you over to Dr. Patel to present his topic, Palpal Therapies for the South African Dentist. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Emdo, for the introduction. Um, I think without further ado, we're going to jump straight into it, yeah? Okay, let's get going. Hey, good evening, everyone, and welcome to today's presentation. Um, I'd like to thank Sada for this invitation um, to chat to you guys tonight, and I look forward to um, a meaningful conversation following this around palpal therapies. So tonight we're going to be chatting a bit about um, palpal therapies for the South African dentist, and just to give you an indication of what we're going to be covering. Um, we'll go through some of the aims of palpal and root therapies. We'll look at the deciduous and permanent dentitions and some of the therapeutic regimens applicable to palpal therapies in both the deciduous and permanent dentitions. So in terms of the aims of palpal and root therapies, according to the uh, American Association of Pediatric Dentists, they talk about maintaining the integrity and health of the teeth and the supporting tissues. So the main themes around it is palpal preservation and tooth preservation, and really realizing that a tooth without a vital pulp can still remain clinically functional. Along with these, um, where applicable, we want to disinfect the root canal system and really to allow for root closure. And that root closure can be gained either by completing the root development using biological mechanisms or by sealing the apical terminal using conventional apexification techniques. So if we look at the deciduous dentition, you know, the first thing that we need to look at is just the anatomy of a deciduous tooth. And one realizes that because of the size of the pulp chamber and the horns of the pulp that really extend quite far up, in a lot of cases um, with caries in this region, you're inevitably going to be close to the pulp. And so one has to be quite uh, well-versed in the palpal therapies available uh, in these type of circumstances. And so if we look at what is um, 
available to us for vital therapies. We look at indirect pulp capping as well as pulpotomies. And then for non-vital, then it's the pulpectomy. So looking at the materials available to us, and I think this is where a lot of interest comes in, that in the last two decades, there's been quite a bit of research around the materials. And with advances in material science, we now have much better options available to us. So for this evening, we're going to talk a little bit about the bioactive calcium silicate cements, which are quite popular at the moment. And that includes your mineral trioxide aggregates, uh, commercial products like your biodentin and your bioaggregates, and multiple other uh, biocinamics that are available on the market today. Um, we'll also just take a look at calcium hydroxide, why it was such a popular material and why this is being slowly um, kind of overrun by the advent of our calcium silicates. Um, we'll touch a bit on phage sulfate and former cresol and what they were initially used for, um, a little bit on the glass ionomers and enamel matrix derivative. So in terms of the glass ionomers, I think, you know, everyone is quite comfortable with the conventional glass ionomers and then the later resin modified glass ionomers. Um, though the glass ionomers that we refer to in palpal therapies is your conventional ones, but also something called surface pre-reacted glass ionomers, where there are certain compounds such as um, sodium, strontium, and really these reactions then aid um, them being part of this. So some researchers tend to call these uh, gliomers or gyomers. Um, in terms of the enamel matrix derivative, and I've included this because it is something being researched, although not used a lot for your palpal therapies. This is essentially a mix of your enamel proteins. So your amelogenins, your tuftalin, enamelin, ameloblastin, and, you know, there has been focus in trying to use this over the palpal area in the hope of gaining a dentine bridge. Um, unfortunately, the studies, a lot of them do show success with the dentine bridge, but not as effective as materials such as your mineral trioxide aggregates. So moving on um, to your MTAs, which I know is where a lot of interest actually lies at the moment. Your MTA was actually developed by Toro Binachet as early as 1993. The earlier formulations was a gray MTA, um, and that was later replaced by a white MTA. If we look at what the material actually entails, it's things like your dicalcium silicates, tricalcium silicates, um, and bismuth oxide as a radio pacifier, and multiple other components that aid its uh, function. Where a lot of interest and where a lot of the advantage of this material comes is in its biological function. That uh, if we look at what it does, essentially it mobilizes the extracellular matrix proteins, things like your transforming growth factor beta or your adrenomedullin. And these stimulate dentinogenesis. But that's not, that's not it with this material. It also um, increases the secretion of things like your vascular endothelial growth factor, and it upregulates gene expression of the runt related transcription factors. Uh, things including osteocalcin, your dentine sialoprotein, as well as alkaline phosphatase, all which are regulatory proteins that drive dentinogenesis. We find that another advantage of your MTA is that the surface morphology of the MTA itself allows for cell attachment. Um, and so all of these functions together allow us not only to use MTA uh, within the dentine space itself for things like pulp therapies, but we can also use it beyond in the bone and cementum areas as well. Uh, what you're seeing on the screen is just because of these functions, the different types of um, areas that you could, you could effectively use uh, MTA in, including your direct and indirect pulp capping, pulpotomies and regeneration, um, perforation repairs, apicectomies, apexification, as well as your perforation and resorption repairs. Um, when we look at biodentine, 
Uh, Biodentine is a very similar product to your mineral trioxide aggregate in that it also contains your tricalcium silicates and your dicalcium silicates. Uh, in terms of the addition to this, it also contains calcium carbonate and that calcium carbonate actually acts as a nucleation site expanding the material. And so one of the main advantages of your biodentine over your MTA is that your MTA takes around two and a half hours to set. There are more recent um, formulations of MTA that uh, decrease that setting time, but your biodentine sets in around 12 minutes. So it's something that can be placed and then obviously something else placed on top of it within the same visit. Unlike with the initial MTAs, you would need to place it, place a temporary restoration and then return um, at a later date at a second visit to then complete the procedure that you were performing. Um, moving on to comparing these materials, I think that, you know, if one looks at the literature, there's been a lot of research into these materials from the initial uh, gray MTAs to the white MTAs to the commercial pro root MTAs, etc. And also looking at them with biodentine. And something that does come across uh, quite strongly in the research now is the advantage of using these materials and the success rates that we're getting with therapies when using these materials. So, so it's kind of becoming quite um, a gold standard, if I can be bold enough to say that, um, that these are the materials that you would want to use uh, that can give you predictable success in, in your treatments. Um, and so just to show you an example of, of how they work, you know, in, apart from just telling you about uh, mobilizing all of these uh, regulatory proteins, um, this is an image, a histological section showing uh, pulp treatments using biodentine on the left and MTA on the right. A and what I want to draw you towards is if we look at the space between the material and the pulp cells, which are lined with the uh, odontoblasts, you can see the nuclei just at the bottom of those sections, we can see a nice homogeneous uh, dentine bridge formation. And it's not just um, homogeneous, but it's also a nice thick area of the dentine bridge and that seals off the palpal space and that is what then gives us the success of this treatment. Okay, the next thing we then look at is, you know, one of the older materials that has been quite popular for a very long time and that is your calcium hydroxides. So calcium hydroxide um, first available and I remember, you know, being a student at, at dental school, uh, we would have calcium hydroxide available as a paste initially, and you would mix this with your local anesthetic uh, and place it. Um, we then also had Dical or Life at the time, which was available. And I think many clinicians will be um, familiar with these products. Um, some of the problems related clinically to these products is that, you know, if you ever mixed something like Dical, they would set very quickly. Um, they wouldn't really stick to the area. They would move quite a bit. And sometimes you would use these products, come back a few weeks later, and it would be completely gone. And as a student, you don't really realize what's going on. You just think, oh, well, you know, this doesn't work very well. But, but afterwards, just going into then what the material science behind it was, we find that calcium hydro hydroxide works relatively well for indirect pulp capping. But when it comes to direct pulp capping, it actually has limited adherence to the area. Coupled with that, we find that you get micro leakage in the area because of that limited adherence. And so the resultant dentine bridge that you get um, tends to have porosities in it. And those porosities then affect the seal and therefore the overall success of your treatment. And so the long-term success rates of those type of pulp therapies then decrease. Um, today, we still find calcium hydroxides in products mixed with multiple other things. Um, three examples that we show here is the Vitapex. Vitapex is a medicated calcium hydroxide. This is where we use iodoform. And this is still used in procedures uh, such as palpectomies uh, with success. And the next type of uh, calcium hydroxide that we get is your ultra blend material. This is an example of calcium hydroxide where a resin is incorporated so that these materials can be light cured. 
So these materials would then be used more for uh, indirect pulp capping procedures and not for any procedure that involves the direct pulpal contact. And that is because the resin is toxic to that area. You then also get your calcium hydroxides, which are pre-mixed in syringes. Um, that is your non-setting calcium hydroxides, again, which can be used in procedures like for pulpectomies, um, but can then also be used, uh, those type of calcium hydroxides in root canal therapy as an intermedicament. So when we compare calcium hydroxide versus your MTA, you know, one of the main things that then stick out is essentially the dentine bridge and the quality of the dentine bridge between the two. And it's that seal and the hardness and completeness of the dentine bridge that you get with MTA that then gives you uh, those um, higher results with this material. Um, the next material that I'd like to cover, and this is more from a historical point of view, is formacresol. We know that formacresol was a material that was used before, mainly for pulpotomies in primary teeth. But with time and with more research, we found that the material was actually toxic and mutagenic uh, with some dental associations then regarding it as carcinogenic. So at this point in time, for me personally, I wouldn't uh, recommend the use of formacresol, especially when there are suitable alternatives available right now. Uh, one of those alternatives is a material um, ferric sulfate, which is often used for, uh, for hemorrhage control. However, in pulpotomies, this is not something that uh, we use for hemorrhage control. It's more as the medicated uh, to medicate the space before restoration. Okay, so when we look at indirect pulp capping, and if you know, if some technicians ask me, well, you know, what are you trying to achieve with indirect pulp capping? Essentially, you're looking for a vital tooth or a tooth with an early reversible pulpitis. We know that the caries has extended uh, quite deep to the pulp, but is not yet broken through that dentine to get into the pulpal space. And so really what you're aiming to do is to create a type of cavity that's going to seal off the lower area to allow the odontoblastic layer and the subodontoblastic layer to respond to lay down additional dentine, thereby reducing the size of the pulp, taking it away from the area of irritation um, and still maintaining a vital pulp or reversing the early pul pulpitis that may ensue from the bacterial invasion. And so what is, the, what is the technique that we use for indirect pulp capping? Um, so essentially the first thing that you want to do is to remove all the caries. And this can either be done uh, using a single visit or a two visit. Um, when you opt for a single visit procedure, you then want to remove all of the caries in the space. If you are opting for a two visit procedure, that is usually where you still have some of that soft dentine overlying the pulpal area. And so recognizing that it's still a reversible pulpitis, but not comfortable to remove all of it, you can then place a medicament over, but in which case you would need to regain entry at a later stage to completely clean up that space. Um, so once all of the carious material is removed, the infected dentine is removed, and you are comfortable with that hard dentine layer, um, we then have an option between an MTA layer, a biodentine layer, or calcium hydroxide, depending on what is available to you. Um, and following that, you then simply uh, place your restoration above. And the choice of restorative material is then yours, whether you are using a composite material or an amalgam material, um, or even something like a stainless steel crown in, uh, in uh, primary teeth, or if you want to go for any of the other options of restoration as well. In terms of your post-treatment outcomes, you want to see immature roots continuously developing, um, so essentially com completing the apexogenesis. But what you don't want to see is sensitivity, pain, or swelling, or essentially any evidence of a pathological change. Um, if you do have that, that then tells you that perhaps the initial diagnosis was incorrect, or the pulp has reached the point of not being able to reverse its pulpitis, in which case you then have to look at more aggressive therapies um, 
to, uh, to be able to treat that specific tooth. Okay, so when we look at vital pulpotomies, um, the technique for this, again, would be to remove all the caries. Once we get into that palpal space, the inflamed palpal tissue is removed in the coronal uh, section, and that's usually about one to three millimeters into that space. In terms of hemorrhage control, um, you want to use a sterile cotton pellet for this. Um, and the reason for this is that by rubbing the sterile cotton pellet over this area, um, we need to control the bleeding within two minutes. Um, if there's bright red blood, we know that this is healthy and this should coagulate um, or rather stop within two minutes. Um, however, if we find that beyond that there's continuous bleeding or we have a very dark red type of blood, we then need to reconsider our diagnosis and if pulpotomy is the correct procedure. Um, there are some articles mentioning chlorhexidine irrigation in the space, in the coronal space for disinfection. Um, and that can sometimes be done, but with care. Uh, to then complete the pulpotomy, once you have hemorrhage control, um, you can use a layer of your MTA. If this is not available, some colleagues also use ferric sulfate. Uh, over that, we then place, if you're placing MTA, you can then place a resin modified glass enema and then restore the tooth. If you are using ferric sulfate, then it's preferable not to use a resin modified glass enema as that would be cytotoxic to the superficial layer of the pulp. Uh, in that case, you'd opt more for a conventional glass enema, or some colleagues would still go with uh, a Zoe cement in that space. So again, in terms of your post-treatment outcome, we are looking for palpal healing and repetitive dent information, which should be evident after a few months. Um, again, you want immature roots to continuously develop, with no sensitivity, pain, swelling, or periapical radiolucencies developing, and again, um, no evidence of pathological change after the procedure. Okay, when looking at pulpectomies, pulpectomies has still remained a fairly straightforward procedure when you have that irreversible pulpitis, the necrotic pulp, and you know that your pulpotomy uh, or pulp capping procedures is not going to be successful. This is when we then opt um, to remove the entire pulp, both coronally and within the radicular space. We clean out that space. Um, and then in terms of the materials that is used, this has also changed over time. Like I said, one of the materials that we can use is your Vitapex. You can also use your non-setting calcium hydroxides and some clinicians still opt to choose um, your zinc oxide eugenols. The important thing is if we are using a zinc oxide eugenol cement, this should be a pure zinc oxide eugenol cement not polystyrene reinforced and not resin reinforced. Um, and that would then be the best to do for that uh, root canal space. Okay, so in terms of the permanent dentition, uh, we find that a lot of the times when we opt for palpal treatments in the permanent dentition, uh, it is because of trauma and there is multiple things that cause trauma in our South African environment, um, from children falling, slipping onto pavements, to walking into poles, to running into a goalpost. Um, I think, you know, as, as clinicians, we find different, different reasons for this type of trauma each day. And so that usually leads uh, in immature teeth uh, when we get that class three Alice fracture that involves the pulp, and we then considering what our options are uh, for those type of scenarios. So in order to understand the options that then come before us, you know, we must also have an indication of the dental root formation and how that forms. And just taking you back to the embryology of tooth formation, you know, as we proceed uh, from the bud stage to the cap stage to the belt stage, um, in that later belt stage, when we get that um, inner and outer enamel epithelium extending down, we then have the epithelial root sheath. And that root sheath is really what drives uh, the actual root formation. So depending on when that root sheath is disturbed, um, that then kind of predicts the outcome of our therapy as well. Whereas the more to the right of this diagram that you are, um, 
the easier it is to get a successful outcome. Um, whereas the more to the left, it becomes a lot more difficult to drive that uh, apexogenesis. Again, just depending on the viability of the cells of the epithelial root sheath. So essentially, this is what you want to do, taking a tooth with an open apex and thin walls, and then uh, stimulating some kind of response that will then allow for complete root closure and the thickening of the dentine walls. So what are the therapies available to us? Uh, for your vital bulbs, it's your indirect and direct bulb capping procedures, your pulpotomy, and your apexogenesis. And for your non-vital, we look at apexification and then root canal treatment. So in terms of the indirect bulk capping, yeah, the procedure remains the same as what you would do within the primary teeth. Uh, but for direct bulk capping, it's a little different. So if we look at apexogenesis, um, essentially, you know, according to the American Association of Endodontics, it is a vital pulp therapy procedure performed to encourage continued physiological development and formation of the root end. And so a really important factor here would be your diagnosis um, to make sure that you actually have vital radicular pulp tissue. And so when we look at the diagnosis, there are multiple uh, facets to that diagnostic procedure, including the main complaint, the history, signs and symptoms, clinical examination, vitality tests, as well as then your radiographic evaluation. And the reason for placing all of these today is that sometimes, and we see this especially with students, where they'll ignore some of those things um, and they'll purely look at a vitality test and based on that vitality test, um, they'll get their diagnosis. And the problem with that is that you do get false tests, false negatives, false positives. And so we have to look at the scenario in entirety in order to, to gain uh, the diagnosis for this tooth. So according to the American Association of Endodontists as well, they have certain guidelines on when to do a pulp cap. I may not agree with all of these, but I thought I'll share them uh, for, for the actual benefit of, of today's participants. Um, in terms of the initial, they say that you can do it when there's occurrence of mechanical exposure of a clinically vital and asymptomatic pulp. And important here is clinically vital and asymptomatic pulp. Uh, you should be able to control the bleeding at the exposure site with ease. And again, controlling that bleeding within one to two minutes of occurring. Um, the possibility of a direct contact of the capping material must exist. Uh, with that tissue after the exposure. Um, and here again, more looking at materials such as your MTA or your biodentine. Um, when that exposure does occur, it must occur under rubber dam isolation. Um, one of my primary thoughts is that if such an occurrence occurs with no isolation, chances are there's already uh, bacterial and saliva invasion into that space. And so it does uh, affect the prognosis of your procedure quite uh, substantially. So one of the things that we advocate at the university is the use of Rabidem for all operative and endodontic procedures. Um, and so if you are in a situation where you do suspect a deep carious lesion, it's always preferable to use a Rabidem in the event that this does become one of your treatment options. Um, we need to uh, be sure that we can maintain an adequate seal of the coronal restoration. And the last one, um, according to these guidelines, is the indication of a possible future endodontic treatment to the patient. Um, and so I don't necessarily agree with, with the sixth one, but, but it is part of the guidelines. Okay, so again, we're looking at traumatized properly involved teeth, but with but that are actually vital. Uh, in terms of symptoms, your patients should report no spontaneous pain or percussion or hemorrhage. Uh, percussion, obviously, something that you are going to test. Um, those should, that test should not be positive. Um, and again, your diagnosis being that of a vital pulp or irreversible pulpitis. Um, the options to achieve apexogenesis would then be your indirect and direct pulp capping or your partial pulpotomies, which includes your carriers or traumatic exposures. 
Okay, and this is just an example um, from one of the clinics in the UAE where, again, just appreciating the level at which the material is placed and the resultant root formation that can occur. So in terms of the clinical technique for the direct pulp cap, again, all caries is deprided. If there is an accidental exposure, this is controlled with a sterile cotton pellet. Um, and we should refrain from, from using things like your vague sulfate in these cases. Um, some clinicians do advocate the use of a 1% sodium hypochlorite solution over these areas. And it is really just a drop of the solution that's rubbed over the space and that just aids uh, the disinfection in that superficial area. Um, we then place our MTA or BioDNT and it is quite important that this is placed directly over the exposed area because it is that contact with the pulpal space um, that does what we spoke about earlier, that drives the transforming growth factor release, the adrenal medullin release, together with the upregulation of the gene expression. So you must try and get this directly onto that palpable space that is exposed, and then obviously sealing off that area. And once you place that, you can then place your restoration above. In terms of post-treatment, um, these kind of remain fairly standard through all of these. You want to witness that healing, the reparative dent information, the roots should continue to grow, and there should be no development um, of any pathological uh, changes over the period of time. Right, so the next thing we then look at is apexification. And apexification has somewhat changed over the last um, decade or so. Uh, so the definition now is a method to induce a calcified barrier in a root with an open apex or the continued apical development of an incomplete form root in, sheet with, uh, in teeth with necrotic pulps. And I think this continued apical development was something that was added um, because of advancements in material science and the techniques as well. And so here we look at conventional methods of root sealing. Um, what we've been taught uh, for quite some time, but then we also have to look at the biological root closure that is capable and that we then look towards regenerative uh, or revascularative endodontic procedures. Okay, so if we look at conventional apexification, I thought I'd include this for completeness. Um, this is still your straightforward apexification procedure. Patient comes in with a non-vital tooth, you gain your access, you then um, place your file in, you clean out the actual uh, root canal system, we irrigate, we then place a medicament, usually calcium hydroxide. Um, that's left for about two weeks. When the patient comes back, we reopen the tooth, remove the calcium hydroxide, irrigate, uh, we then dry this out completely. And the main thing we're achieving here is at that appointment, you wanna place an MTA or a biodentine plug and that plug is placed within the last three millimeters of the actual apical space. So we need to use very specific instruments that then assist us from the coronal axis cavity to push that material down towards the apical third. Uh, some of the instruments that one can use is instruments such as the micro apical placement uh, system. Once we have that apical plug uh, sealing off that area, we then complete the treatment. Now here as well, if you have sufficient dentine and structural integrity is not in question, you can go ahead and then seal with your gutta perca and then restore the tooth. However, if you feel that this tooth is at a point where the dentine uh, walls are too thin or the structural integrity is compromised, uh, some researchers have also advocated the use of a glass ionomer to actually complete this obturation. And so the glass ionomer then completely fills the root canal space and that then gives you um, more strength to the tooth uh, so that it can last within the oral cavity uh, for a little longer. Okay, if we look at the objectives, um, it's induction of root enclosure at the apices of the immature roots and essentially an apical barrier, which should then be confirmed clinically as well as radiographically. Um, what you want to see in these teeth after this procedure is that they should continue to erupt and the alveolus should continue to grow in conjunction with the adjacent teeth. And again, 
um, you don't want to see any signs of sensitivity, pain, or swelling. Um, and also no radiographic evidence of external root resorption, lateral pathosis, root fracture, or breakdown of periodicular supporting tissues. Right, so the exciting part of this then comes to your regenerative endodontic procedures. And a lot of the times, the second I mention regenerative endodontic procedures, I see people tend to run away from me. Um, regenerative endo is actually quite an exciting field. Um, and the techniques that we can use in a South African setting are actually simple and something that is achievable. Um, just to give you background of regenerative endodontic procedures, um, a lot of the time when we speak regenerative, we're actually talking about revascularization. When we um, talk of true regeneration, that is when we use cell-based therapies to reintroduce certain stem cells into the environment. So what do we need to achieve um, regeneration or revascularization? There are essentially three things that you need. Um, you need a scaffold, and that can either be naturally or synthetically derived. Um, and that can be in, in the form of foams, fibers, gels. Um, people also use polymers such as your PLGA uh, or your polylactic acids as scaffolds. And those scaffolds are there to act as a 3D environment in which your cells can grow. Now, what are the cells that we're talking about? We're talking about your stem cells, whether those are your adult stem cells or your embryonic stem cells whether uh, gotten from the patient or uh, other sources uh, or that may be cultivated or engineered within a laboratory space. And together with the cells, because if you put cells on a scaffold, um, nothing's just gonna happen. You need something to tell it what to do. And so that is where your signals come into play. Uh, things like your transforming growth factors, your bone morphogenetic proteins, and then your various signaling pathways like your WNT pathway. Um, in terms of stem cells and where we get stem cells within the oral environment, um, the tooth and its surrounding tissues are actually a rich area for stem cells from the dental pulp itself, which is where a lot of what is responsible uh, in the mechanism for direct and indirect pulp gap working uh, comes from, that's the dental pulp stem cells. You then also get stem cells around the gingiva, the periodontal ligament, and then the other area that we use uh, being the stem cells from the apical papilla, which we draw up into the tooth for your revascularization. So there's two types of procedures that can be done. We get a cell-free procedure and a cell-based procedure. Um, in summary, the cell-free procedure is where we access the area, we clean it out. Um, at the second appointment, we stimulate bleeding, which then comes into the root canal space. We then stop that bleeding, place an MTA layer over that um, and cover that with a permanent coronal restoration. We then expect that the uh, stem cells from the apical papilla that are drawn in together with the growth factors available in the environment will then drive um, the processes necessary to complete root development. And that's usually a process that happens over a three month to two year period. Cell-based pulp regeneration um, is similar to the cell-free, except that in the second appointment, we then introduce uh, these cells from the coronal aspect uh, into the area. And again, that can be manipulated uh, according to how advanced a specific lab is or the area in which you work. Um, you can then actually introduce the type of cells that you want uh, to gain what it is that you need from that area in this uh, particular aspect um, root growth and complete closure of the actual apex. Okay, so just covering two uh, techniques or therapeutic regimens that you can uh, that you can do, um, and hopefully the first one something that you can do in your practice come tomorrow. Um, for your cell free regeneration, um, this is the the treatment regimen that we follow. So the first visit, you use your local anesthetic, and that would be any local anesthetic uh, of your choice, followed by isolation. Isolation is a key component to the success of these procedures. We then follow that up with uh, accessing into the tooth, 
um, and getting our working length. And that working length is usually a file positioned loosely at around one millimeter from the root end. Remember these are immature roots and so there is no complete apex. We follow that up with irrigation and the irrigation is important because we need to disinfect the system. Um, we also don't want to use a very strong irrigating solutions because that will then kill off the growth factors that we find within the dentine tubule systems. So we irrigate with a 1.5% sodium hypochlorite solution, and that's usually an average of 20 moles per canal over five minutes. Um, we follow that up with a 17% EDTA solution, again, sort of a similar quantity. Once we do that, we then dry the canal uh, with paper points and we place in either calcium hydroxide or a triple antibiotic paste. Um, and that's at a concentration no greater than one milligram per, per mole. And a temporary restoration is then placed. These temporary restorations must be with materials that uh, completely seal up the space. Um, so I prefer something like a glass anima, which, which will seal the area. So we usually then call the patient back two to three weeks later. Um, and then we perform a clinical examination first to see how the tooth has responded. Um, if there's any signs of sensitivity or we have any positive palpation or percussion tests, if there's a sinus tract or swelling, um, something that you see in this uh, clinical photograph on the left from one of our patients where we still saw that persistence um, in the area just above the 2-2, um, then you would need to repeat the first visit regimen. So everything that you do in the first visit, you would need to repeat. Um, a must at this appointment though, is if you did not use the triple antibiotic paste initially, then you must use this paste. So what is the triple antibiotic paste? Essentially, it is a mix of uh, ciprofloxacin, uh, metronidazole, as well as your minocycline. In South Africa, we get minocycline as a capsule, a 100 milligram capsule. Your ciprofloxacin, the lowest dose you can get is the 250 milligram tablet. And then your ciprofloxacin, I'm mean, sorry, that's your 250 milligram. And then your metronidazole, your 200 milligram. Uh, to mix the space, we usually cut the ciprofloxacin and metronidazole tablets in half using only half of each. And we then open the capsule and empty the contents of the capsule of the minocycline. Those three are then mixed together um, in a, in, with local anesthetic, or you could even use uh, distal water or saline. Um, you create a mixture and then you deliver that directly into the root canal system using uh, as sterile techniques as possible. Right, at, so once you have achieved resolution of those symptoms and you're happy, uh, it's usually two to three weeks after that, either the first visit or that uh, revisit, and so at this appointment, we now use a local anesthetic without adrenaline. And it's important to use one without adrenaline at this appointment because we do want to stimulate bleeding in the area. And if there is a vasoconstrictor uh, within our anesthetic, that then affects uh, that coming into the canal uh, system. Again, we need to isolate uh, to ensure complete moisture control in the space. Um, once we access, we irrigate with a 17% EDTA solution. So this time we don't use uh, sodium hypochlorite, we use EDTA. And the reason for the EDTA is that it actually uh, assists with the release of the growth factors from the actual dentine uh, structures. So some research has shown that we do get growth factors within the dentine tubular structures, uh, which can be released. And so we use an EDTA solution and not sodium hypochlorite, which would effectively kill uh, those cells. Okay, once we do that, again, we dry the canal with our paper points and then using a sterile K file, we then go to full working length and then two millimeters beyond. And that two millimeters beyond is usually to then stimulate bleeding in the surrounding space. So the K file that you use shouldn't be too small nor should should it be too large? So it's usually around a size 20 or even a 25, depending on the size of the apical foramen. Um, so this is the type of bleeding you would expect coming up into the space. That bleeding is then uh, stopped um, or once we wait for that blood to clot, applying pressure with a sterile cotton pellet, we can then place a collagen 
plug over, and this is available as either collar tape, collar coat, or a collar plug. Um, so a small layer of that is placed over the actual area. These are completely resorbable. And that is followed by MTA or biodentin. Um, usually this is around a two to three millimeter uh, layer of this material. Um, and again, we are relying on it to stimulate the upregulation of uh, those genes responsible to drive the dentinogenesis. Um, once you have that, you can then place a resin modified glass ornament to seal off the space completely, followed by your permanent restoration. And then follow up is usually done at three months, six months, and yearly for up to four years. But usually at around two years, you see complete root development. Um, if the trauma had occurred very early on in root development, then yes, that would, that would take a longer time. In terms of our cell-based regeneration, that is uh, very similar to the cell-free in that at the initial visit, um, your normal local anesthetic, isolation, you gain access to the tooth, clean out the space, get your working length, and irrigate as well. So that uh, remains uh, fairly um, the same. Uh, at that same visit, you're going to enlarge the apical foramen. We use our irrigation. Um, you can also use laser irradiation. Uh, so that is something that you can use as well. But um, the type that is going to stimulate the area, um, so not essentially um, completely for disinfection of the area, because that would kill the surrounding growth factor cells as well, is they are quite sensitive. Uh, for cell-based regeneration, we want to use the triple antibiotic based as our intracanal medicament. Um, so you need to use triple antibiotic base and not calcium hydroxide uh, for this particular treatment regimen. When the patient comes back at the second visit, two to three weeks later, again, uh, the same procedure that you would do is for your cell-free uh, treatment regimen with the only addition that now you would draw 10 moles of blood into an anticoagulant free vacutainer. So this is usually where I lose people. And this is why I think a lot of South African dentists don't want to do cell-based because it involves the drawing of 10 moles of blood. Um, so this is something that you can perhaps get the, the patient to go into a lab close to you or in centers that have uh, labs attached to them. It's just 10 moles of blood in an anticoagulant vacutainer. And that is then centrifuged at 2,500 RPMs just for around five to 10 minutes. Um, and the reason that we centrifuge it is essentially to get a fibrin clot. And that fibrin clot is what we then insert into the root canal space after we induce the bleeding. So after you push your K file beyond the apex and you get that blood coming into the space, we then take this fibrin clot and we push it into that system. Reason being because this houses a lot of the cells and the signaling pathways required um, to drive that tentinogenesis. So essentially we are just upping uh, those factors to ensure success uh, of the treatment. So once you have done that and you've placed the fibrin clot, you can uh, clot, you can then place your resolvable collagen mesh, uh, your MTA, and then once again, your resin modified glass enema uh, and your permanent restoration. And, and that concludes that with your then follow-ups at your three months, six months periods, and then yearly for up, a period up to four years. Okay, and then these are just some examples of uh, this type of treatment. Again, noting just the level at which your MTA is placed, allowing for that blood within the root canal space, and then the changes uh, that occur over a one to two year period. Um, this is just another example um, where we have uh, a premolar this time with an immature root, um, the revascularization process with the material. Uh, and if you look closely on the follow-up after one month, you can see the difference between the MTA layer and the rest of the restoration. Um, we then witness uh, root growth um, from as early as about four months and after two years, complete root development uh, within that space. And with that, uh, I conclude my presentation. Um, so I hope that I didn't lose a lot of you along the way. And yeah, open to, to any questions that you may have. Thank you, Dr. Patel, for a wonderful presentation. I think after tonight's uh, presentation, a lot of colleagues will have a much better understanding of the different 
palpable therapies available? So we do have a few questions that have come in. So the first question is, can a product called MTA Philippex, which is a bioceramic root canal sealer, be used for direct pulp calc as also for apexogenesis? Okay. Um, yeah, so we are aware of uh, Philippex. So, so we need to look further into the constituents of the material itself. For indirect pulp capping, it would definitely work. Whilst the MTA would still be the active component, um, we need to look if it was reinforced because it's being used as a sealer, if it's being reinforced with any other material that would cause damage to the surrounding pulpal cells. Um, but from what I know about the material, you should be able to use it um, for, for that purpose as well. Okay, the second question in is, I read previously that ordinary building cement can also be used in pulpotomy, is that so? Okay, so this, you know, in the early days of MTA, uh, this used to be something frequently asked. Um, uh, and, you know, people would often refer to something called Portland cement. And they would say that uh, MTA is no different to any uh, cement that you get. Um, so my answer to that would be no, we don't use uh, ordinary building cement because there are specific uh, components within the MTA and in fact any um, bioceramic material or any calcium silicate material that will then drive the actual processes. Um, the problem is that it has to be regulated in terms of the amounts of each material because that does affect the way gene expression occurs. Um, if you get too much gene expression uh, as something that's often seen with your calcium hydroxides, that then affects the resultant quality of your dentine bridge. Um, so, so no. Okay, thanks Dr. Putin. In palpotomies or palpectomies in the deciduous teeth, is it mandatory to do this under GA? Uh, no, um, you can do these. In fact, uh, a lot of them are done within the chair uh, where you have a much more controlled environment and it can be done under rubber dam as well. Um, I know that a lot of people will cringe when you mention rubber dam in a pediatric patient, um, but these are procedures that we do chair side. It doesn't have to be under GA. Which material would you recommend to fix the pulp? Okay. Um, that was so, a bit of a vague question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm guessing it would be they're referring to reverse the pulpitis. Um, so materials available in the South African market, um, MTA or biodentine or any of the bioceramic uh, materials that are indicated for pulp capping are uh, fine. As long as it is calcium silicate based, I think you would have a good success rate. Okay, another question in is, what is your reason for not entirely agreeing with the AAE guideline? Okay, so, so the specific one that I didn't completely agree with was where they said that direct pulp capping can be done where you, um, it, it was point number six, where you anticipate that you may need to do a root canal for the future, in the future. Um, my, my thinking is that if you are anticipating a failure of the direct pulp cap, it could be that your thinking is already that this is beyond a reversible towards an irreversible pulpitis. So in that instance, is it fair to your patient to do the direct pulp cap if you're anticipating that you're going to do the root canal anyways. Um, so, so that is my reason for not entirely agreeing with that point uh, of the guidelines. Okay, so another question in is, if a patient has traumatized the tooth 24 hours earlier and it's asymptomatic, non-tender with no clinical symptoms and the pulp is vitally normal, would a direct pulp cap with MTA or biodentine be appropriate? Okay, so, so the problem with the time lag in that particular instance is if it was a class three Alice fracture and you had exposure of the pulp, you then have 24 hours of bacterial exposure to that specific pulp. 
And the reason it, uh, it being asymptomatic or non-tender, remember that you know teeth can also go into shock and you may not get a clear reading immediately. And so in those instances, you know, um, I mean, we wanna be as conservative as possible. And so if the patient were to come to you and, and, and you wanted to earn the side of caution, then I would say clean it up. I would probably use a 1% sodium hypochlorite just to wipe the superficial layer, um, place the MTA, seal it up. But then you would need to test vitality within seven days following that. And then also just um, monitor that tooth over um, usually, you know, I've had cases up to one year where vitality actually after a year, a patient comes back with a non-vital tooth. So uh, you just need to monitor that to ensure that uh, it is successful. And if it does become um, non-vital, then you would need to go ahead with the root canal treatment. Okay. In controlling hemorrhage during pulpotomies, will the usage of a sterile cotton pellet soaked with a little local anesthesia be advisable? Okay. So, so my thing around the pulpotomies is that um, a huge part of the pulpotomy being successful is the vitality of that reticular pulp. And so we don't want to use any material that is going to um, disguise uh, the, 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 that symptoms. Meaning that, you know, if you use fake sulfate or local anesthetic, your local anesthetic is going to have adrenaline in it, which is going to cause vasoconstriction. And so using that um, to gain that hemorrhage control may give you the false, um, the false security that, that the, pulp, the, the pulp is still fine, when in fact it may have pushed onto an irreversible pulpitis. So, so I'd still recommend just a sterile cotton pellet um, to, to rub onto the area for two minutes, and that should be sufficient to control uh, the bleeding. Okay. Um, can gelatin be used instead of collotape? Um, I'm not familiar with gelatin, provided that it is resorbable and sterile when you open the packaging, it should be fine. It's just a barrier in the initial stage to, to stabilize the blood clot. Um, so provided that it's resorbable, you should be able to use it. Okay, how do you remove the fibrin clot from the vacutainer tube? Okay, so, so the fibrin clot actually becomes like a gelatinous um, mass. So, so if you take a, a sterile uh, cotton forceps or what would be easier um, is a tweezer, a sterile tweezer, you could actually go into that vacutainer and lift it up and it would pull up as, as one solid uh, mass that comes out of the vacutainer. Uh, what is the success rate for pulpectomies in primary teeth? Okay, um, so for your pulpectomies, remember you, you are removing everything provided that you do disinfect the area uh, completely. And depending on how, um, how well your coronal restoration seals the actual tooth, uh, you get a fairly good success rate. I, I can't give you a number offhand, um, but those are the two main factors. It's your disinfection and the coronal seal that will then drive the, the success of the pulpectomy. Okay, we have another question in. If you could please repeat the three antibiotic paste. Sure. Um, so it was ciprofloxacin, and that's available as a 250 milligram tablet. The metronidazole, uh, available as a 200 milligram tablet. And your minocycline, available as a 100 milligram capsule. So to mix the paste, you're going to cut the ciprofloxacin tablet in half, you're going to cut the metronidazole tablet in half, and you're going to empty the contents of the minocycline capsule. You do that on a sterile glass slab. Um, that can then be mixed together with either saline or distilled water. Um, you then mix that uh, on a glass slab and then deliver that into the uh, root canal space. Okay, there's a follow-up question to that. What is the ide ideal consistency of the paste? Okay, um, so essentially you want it to be kind of creamy in nature, something that you can manipulate. 
uh, to put into the canal system. Um, I prefer it a little thicker and not runny. Once it becomes very runny, um, it's very difficult to manipulate and the chances of it running even beyond the apex of the tooth are also much higher. Uh, so you want it to be a creamy consistency. Okay, with apexogenesis, is it strictly coronally done and not retrograde? Yeah, so you remember that um, the idea behind apexogenesis is to stimulate the epithelial root sheath within the apical space to continue root development. If we go into that um, area retrogradely, we'll most likely damage those cells uh, and we won't achieve what we want to. So ideally, we want to do this from a coronal aspect to allow the root to grow um, in a manner that it can without us hindering its growth by placing a material retrogradely. Okay, this is a question for you, Dr. Patel. How many successful option two uh, re regeneration procedures have you done? Um, in South Africa, I'd say only around two or three. It's not something that we do very often because I have to be in an environment where I have access uh, to drawing blood and then centrifuging it. Okay, the fibrin clot that you talk about, which part is that? The PPP, the PRP, or the red blood cells? Okay, so not the, not the red blood cells. Essentially, you want the plasma-rich uh, area the, or the... Uh, the platelet, uh, the platelet rich area. So yeah, uh, you could refer to it as the PPP or the PRP, but not the red blood cells. Um, so if you go back to the presentation, again, it's kind of that um, whitish gelatinous mesh uh, in between the two areas, not, not the clear on top and not the red um, hematocrit at the bottom in the middle. Okay, does cell-based regenerative therapy restore vitality in the tooth? And does a successful regenerative procedure have to be followed up by conventional RCT or do you just leave the tooth as it is? Okay, so if your regenerative procedure is successful, then you don't do anything further because you would have revascularized the tooth. Uh, so, so there's no, it, it negates the need for a root canal treatment. Um, does cell-based uh, restore vitality? Again, it depends on the type of stem cells that are brought into the space. But in most cases, you're not going to get a uh, re-innovation of the tooth. And so you're not going to get any nerves growing into the space. So it's just revascularized and not re-innovated. Okay, we have a colleague who missed the advantages of biodentine over MTA and asked if you could please uh, repeat it. Okay, um, there's two advantages that biodentine has over uh, MTA. The one is that the initial MTAs had bismuth oxide and that together with the aluminum content was seen to discolor the tooth. Um, that's subsequently been changed um, biodentine had something called tantalum oxide, which then didn't uh, discolor the tooth. The main advantage uh, of the materials was the setting time, uh, where biodentine sets within 12 minutes, whereas your older MTAs would take up to two and a half hours. But I believe that you do get MTA materials now, which are fast set materials, uh, where that setting time has reduced. Um, so that was the main advantage of biotentine over the MTA, the setting time. Okay. What is the best intracanal root canal medicament to use during a multi-visit root canal treatment? Okay. So th that's a very interesting question. Um, I think a lot of people would tell you calcium hydroxide. But the latest research is showing us that your enterococci species uh, your Efecalis specifically um, is resistant to calcium hydroxide. So many will still use calcium hydroxide, um, but then I would recommend um, a more thorough irrigation protocol uh, to use just to ensure that those um, lateral canals and the dental tubules are disinfected uh, correctly. Okay. 
which is more cost effective, MTA or biodentine? So if we look at the products uh, on the South African market at the moment, um, looking at the material like your MTA flow from Ultradent, that allows you to mix the amount of MTA that you need in a consistency um, that you require. Biodentine, in, on the other hand, comes in a capsule, which you triturate. And so you use the amount that you need and you need to discard the rest. Uh, in terms of price, these are expensive materials. Um, I believe that the biodentine is around just over 3,000 Rand for the box. And there's about 15 applications uh, within it. Um, and so if you break it down to the number of applications, uh, they're more or less the same price. Um, but what, uh, what I would say is that remember that even if you are billing at medical aid rates, there is a cost of MTA code that you can charge when using these materials. Thanks, Dr. Patel. In the recent literature, triple antibiotic paste is now replaced by a double antibiotic paste. Do you agree with this change? So it, it depends um, what with the scenario that you have. Um, I find that you know I've spoken to many clinicians who uh, tend to change and try different things. I've heard of pastes including augmentin and metronidazole. I've heard of pastes with just amoxicillin and metronidazole. I think it's it works on what the scenario actually is. The initial thinking behind using the ciprofloxacin, metronidazole, and minocycline was because of the broad spectrum um, that the three uh, together would actually uh, target. But if you choose antibiotic pastes uh, carefully, which cover the bacterial species that, that are in the space, um, then by all means, you use a double antibiotic paste but just um, be aware of what the spectrum of cover is uh, when you make that change. What is your opinion on terical indirect or indirect pulp caps under composite restoration? Um, I must be honest, I don't, I don't have a lot of experience with terical. Um, I'd have to look just a little bit into the, the material itself. Uh, and then get back and get back to you. From the name, I'm guessing it's a calcium hydroxide. And if you're using the calcium hydroxide, um, I prefer you placing a resin modified glass enema before you place the composite over it. Please advise treatment for internal resorption of coronal pulp in primary tooth. The tooth appears pink in color and pulp enlarged. Okay, um, so if you have internal resorption of the coronal pulp, um, it, it would probably be quite be ex, uh, in a primary tooth, it would probably be uh, quite accelerated. So you can, you can go for the pulpotomy, but uh, chances are that that may then extend into the reticular portion as well. Um, so, you, so, you, so perhaps you may consider a pulpectomy for the tooth, um, uh, for that specific uh, primary tooth. Okay. Can your protocol with pulpal regeneration be used for conventional RCTs in permanent teeth with necrotic pulps? And if not, why not? Okay. Um, so it mainly comes down to the development of the roots and that once that root development completes, the epithelial, the epithelial root sheath also becomes quite dormant. Um, so doing it in a fully formed tooth is almost like restarting a factory, so to speak. Um, because of the closed apices, um, you would actually have to destroy the apical foramen to, to get blood into the space. And, and so in, in this type of setting, um, I've never attempted it in a permanent tooth with closed apices. And uh, I don't think that it would work because of uh, the limited supply then being able to come into the space to actually then uh, support uh, 
the tissue after regeneration. Okay, there's a follow-up question to the 24-hour exposure question that somebody had asked earlier. And uh, this mm -hmm. is, would you use a CVEC pulpotomy in that instance? Um, you could attack uh, the high pulpotomy or SAC uh, for, the, for that particular tooth. Um, again, you know, with the 24-hour exposure though, um, the bacteria may go well beyond just the, the coronal pulp. Um, and, and so again, it is a gamble. You know, you can choose to take the, um, the more conservative route, but, but you need to monitor to see if, if it actually works. In terms of cell base regeneration, um, the question is in terms of failure of root generation, uh, have you seen these failures? Will you still advocate for it? And RCTs beyond apex and thereafter MTA in terms of apiectomy or extraction and immediate implant placement. Okay, um, so in terms of the failure of root regeneration, yes. Um, not all root regeneration uh, procedures work. So, you know, you can attempt it. Um, so I've had cases where we'll do the first visit and sometimes we, after the triple antibiotic based, we'll get uh, it subsiding. Uh, we'll do the second visit, but we won't then actually witness any regeneration taking place, meaning that the root won't continue developing. In those cases, it's likely that the epithelial root sheet cells have actually disintegrated or they've died over time. And so we then have to uh, switch to a conventional apexification method where we then seal the apex with our MTA and then complete um, the root canal that way. Okay. We have another question in, why are we using 1.5% and not 1% of sodium hypochlorite? Um, you, you can use a 1% uh, sodium hypochlorite solution. That's also fine. Uh, just remember that when using a 1% solution, uh, make sure that the material is not cold. It should be slightly warm. And that's because um, the efficacy of the sodium hypo will increase um, at, at uh, that higher temperature. So by all means, you can use a 1% solution. Just make sure that um, not heated, just a little warm. Okay, then we have a question about, is TCF and calzenol contraindicated currently in deciduous pulpotomy? So I, I prefer that if you are using a zinc oxide usual, um, that it be a pure zinc oxide usual. I am aware of clinicians that use calzenol uh, for pulpotomies. Um, the thing with the calzenol or with any zinc oxide uh, usual cement over pulpotomies is that it is cytotoxic and it does cause a certain degree of cytotoxicity of the pulp. Um, and so I agree MTA is more costly, but in terms of the predictability of your treatment, uh, it gives you a lot more predictability uh, going forward. To get the paste, can you mix it with local anesthetic instead of saline or distilled water? Uh, yes, you can. Okay. Then we have another question about case selection for palpable regeneration. Okay. Um, so the case selection, uh, and there's a few things to consider uh, where, where, when you're doing that. Um, you need to look at the medical history of the patient you need to look at the willingness of the patient to go through the actual procedure um, and the overall um, oral hygiene of the patient, uh, et cetera. So there's a few things that you do consider uh, when, you, where, when you're selecting patients for this type of treatment, uh, because it, it definitely, it's not something for everyone. It's, it, you're not going to choose uh, to do it for, for, for everyone either. Okay, so we have a question about how do you keep the biodentine in place for a direct pulp exposure less than one millimeter diameter in a fractured incisor tooth before a composite restoration? The consistency of biodentine is difficult to manipulate. Okay, so when you're mixing biodentine, 
uh, it comes down to how much of the calcium chloride solution that you're placing in the capsule before triturating. So when we're doing our direct pulp caps, we use five drops of the solution into the capsule and then we triturate for uh, 30 seconds in the amalgamator. Um, that gives us a, a resultant material that's uh, kind of thick. And so when you place it, it is manipulable in the space and it does hold. Um, if you empty the entire contents of the calcium chloride uh, into there, it's around seven drops. You'll find that your biodentine is a lot more wet. Um, it flows a lot more, it's very soft, and it takes a, lot, a much longer time to actually set. Um, and so I, I can understand the frustration uh, behind using it and then waiting to actually do your composite restoration. So uh, my suggestion would be maybe to drop down to five uh, drops of it and that will give you a better consistency. Okay. Is the triple antibiotic paste sometimes indicated when doing an RCT instead of calcium hydroxide? So we have had cases, um, especially at the hospital, where we find with chronic infections, some patients um, don't respond to the calcium hydroxide. Uh, from a private setting, I find that those, those patients respond very well when using laser-assisted irrigation. But if you don't have access to that, uh, we have used the triple antibiotic paste um, in conventional RCTs um, to stabilize the tooth before completion. So, so, so yes, there are cases where you can use it. Okay. Would you use a, a propylene glycol as a carrier liquid for the antibiotic? This was advocated in another lecture. Um, personally, I haven't used uh, propylene glycol, um, but again, as, as long as the material is stable, it doesn't affect the efficacy of the antibiotics, um, and, it, and you get it within a form that is fair, fairly sterile, um, you should be able to use the propylene glycol. Okay. Then we have a question about if you know the ICD-10 code for MTA. Um, I do know the code. <laughs> it just slipped my mind. <laughs> um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll get back to you. Uh, I'll just uh, I'll look it up again. But yeah, I'll, I'll look it up. For okay. Thing. okay. Um, are you not afraid of inducing antibiotic resistance with the use of your triple antibiotic paste? Okay, so, so the use of the triple antibiotic paste is in a very controlled environment. You're using it solely within the tooth um, and not very to, to, to go beyond. Um, because of the two week period that we are using it in and in a small environment, uh, chances are that you're not going to be uh, building uh, resistance to, to someone that's taking an oral formulation over a five uh, to seven day period. So again, you know, it's a, it's a once off thing. Uh, I do understand the concern around antibiotic resistance, but it, it is within a control environment. Uh, so so it, it shouldn't be that detrimental uh, to the patient. Okay. And then can the antibiotic paste be used as an intracanal medicament between visits? Okay. So this actually builds onto the previous question. Um, again, it's not something that we use routinely. I, I wouldn't say use it for every single uh, visit that you're going to have. We will only consider the triple antibiotic paste in um, what I call stubborn cases, where we're not getting resolution of the infection um, and you need that assistance. Uh, that's when I would advocate the antibiotic base, not routinely. Okay. And then how vital is the use of a rubber dab to the success of the treatment? In some cases, placement of rubber dam is impossible. What percentage of failures due to not using a rubber dam would you see? So, so for me personally, um, you cannot perform this, these procedures without a rubber dam. Um, and it's simply because of not being able to control the moisture. Um, it's not just about, you know, uh, some people will tell me, no, we use cotton rolls, we use gauze, there's other ways. Um, yes, I am a, I'm aware of things like the isolate devices in there, uh, which isolate the teeth and, and those then should give you a more 
um, a better advantage, I suppose. But without the use of Rabidem, you cannot perform these procedures. So one of the things we advocate at the university, especially when students are doing conventional root therapies, is to first build up the entire tooth, uh, remove all the caries, completely prepare the cavity, build up the entire tooth so that you can place on your rubber dam and then go through to do your root canal treatment. Um, you'll find that that way it actually saves you a lot more time in trying to juggle around not having the rubber dam in place. Okay. A colleague did send through um, the code for MTA. It's 8306. I'm not sure if that's correct. That sounds about right. Okay. So that, that brings the end to our Q&A session. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Patel, and thank you to colleagues for sending through their, their questions. Um, there's a reminder just to complete an evaluation at the end of the webinar. And also there's two more webinars coming up in May. On the 25th of May, we have the SADA and the PPS, Business Assurance, Protecting Your Practice with Mr. H.P. Turin. And on the 27th of May, we have SADA and the Stroman Group presenting the timing of implant therapy and fixed prosthodontics with Dr. Ridwan Hafiji. Okay, thank you so much colleagues for availing your time and for being part of this webinar. And thank you so much to Dr. Patel for your time and for enlightening colleagues on the various treatments that are available. And thank you for your insights. There were a few colleagues that requested if you could share your slides. Um, we could possibly do that through SADA where okay. um, they can yeah. probably email events at sada.co.za and we'll try to make um, the slides available. Yeah, that's fine. Thank okay. you so much for having me, Dr. Endo, and thank you everyone for your uh, attendance here today.